First World Order Radio, finally, finally, we are on the air. No doubt. All right, all right. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. We get on into some of that order consciousness tonight. First World Order Radio every Wednesday, 8 p.m. We got to talk about what is taking place on the planet. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. First, we need to let you know we're going to be doing more shows, giving out more information on Wednesdays. Wednesday is 8 o'clock. We are now going to make this is the hottest day of the week. Seen in others in time, order, importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns in existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetics of sound through the air, same that your thoughts transmit it. Proceed in others in time, order, importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns in existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetics of sound through the air, same that your thoughts transmit it. You need to understand how magical this, uh, something like this every Wednesday can become. So you need to start uh, getting your calendar right, get your schedule, your schedule right. You need to know our intention straight out. All right, so, I mean, these clues are given throughout the various languages was to piece the puzzle of this ancient history school back together again. And what we plan on doing, both of us, is bringing y'all some surefire dynamite. We're going to take this level up a notch. We're going to have stuff to do here. This is not just going to be about philosophies and theories and shit that works. This is Dr. Ali Mel Bay once again. And um, tonight's discussion is going to be on um, who are the real indigenous people of North America. Um, there's a lot of nonsense going on, so we're going to attempt to clear up and set the record straight. So um, now I guess we can begin and get into the information. All right, if you read, I guess you can say Forbidden Archaeology, um, The Hidden History of the Human Race, by Michael Cremore and uh, Richard Thompson. Um, they report that a groove spear, um, a fear, um, from the Precambrian South African miners um, have found hundreds of metallic spears um, well underground, at least one of which had three parallel grooves running across its equator. According to scientists, the this, um, this fears um, are found in um, a phyo, um, phyllic rock, which is mined in Western Transvaal, South Africa, which is 2.8 billion years old. Not million, 2.8 billion years old. And it says that the uh, fears um, are not natural objects and their origin is unknown. They obviously was created by the intelligent beings. All right, so let's find out who these intelligent beings are in which that they speak about who was smoking metal 2.8 billion years ago. Now, for those that don't know, according to science, the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. So this was more than half um, of the Earth's existence that there was intelligent beings upon planet Earth smoking metals. Now, if you get Scientific American magazine um, it contained a report about blasting carry out at Meeting Hill Rock in Dorchester, Massachusetts. This is issued June 5th, 1852. And the title of it is called A Metallic Vase Found in Precambrian Rock. And Cambrian. And it says the blast disgorged tons of rocks described by the United States. Geological Survey as pudding stone dating back over 600 million years old. 
a bell-shaped metallic vessel was blown out of the rock that was about four inches high and was covered with exquisite carving, indicating the presence of artistic metalworking over 600 million years ago, right here in what we now refer to as North America or the United States of America, all right, um, in near Meeting Hill Rock in Dorchester, Massachusetts. Now, if you get the book by British uh, Egyptologist W. M. Fellings, um, Petrie, um, it's called The Making of Egypt, on page 68. He states that there is the um, Aboriginal race um, of the Pygmies. And he states that they were the first inhabitants, all right? And not just the first inhabitants, but also the first inhabitants of Egypt, okay? Um, as a matter of fact, we go into the signs and symbols of primordial man about Albert Churchward. Jamie went up there to get him. Mm-hmm. The signs and symbols of primordial man by Albert Churchward states that the pygmies are the original and the oldest living people on the face of the planet Earth. The now Negroes were probably one of the first of the end root race that was the first and the oldest race of men after the pygmies. All right? Um, this is what he states. In Gods and Spacemen in Ancient West, don't let that title fool you. He's dropping a lot of information. The book is by Raymond Drake. He states that the pygmies inhibit Earth for 30 million years. Now, that's at least, you know, right, the Twa people, the pygmies. They're also called the Anu or the Anu race, also known as the Amu or the Amur race, all right? But they inhibit the planet Earth for at least 30 million years, according to his book, according to his research and findings. All right. Now, who are the pygmies? The pygmies are in various ethnic groups worldwide. All right? Their bones have been found in Australia. Their bones have been found in Africa. Their bones have been found throughout India and Asia and also here in um, North America and Central and South America. All right? So their bones have been found all over the world. But anthropologist defines the pygmies as a group whose adult males grow less than 150 centimeters or 4 feet 11 inches in average height. All right? Um, those who are slightly taller, they refer to them as pygmoids. All right? Um, the best-known pygmies are the Aka, the Ifa, and the Mobuti of Central Africa. And there are also pygmies in Australia, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines, the Philippines, um, Poly New Guinea, and Brazil. Hence the term also Asiatics. Um, the term also includes the Negrito or Northeast Asia, the remains of the least 25 miniature humans who lived between 1,000 and 3,000 years ago was found on the islands of Palu in Micronesia. Now, in the book called the Congo Katapu, um, originally it was called The Pygmy, and it was um, by Katapu Jean-Pierre Hallett. Um, he documents that the pygmies of Zaire, um, as the world's most genetically pure ethnic group, is surviving since the dawn of humanity in real harmony with God, nature, and each other. In the Hidden Life of Freemasonry by Charles W. Ledbetter, 33 Degrees Mason, he states that the pygmy race is a relic of the old Lemurians 
and represents them more purely than any other people. At one time, the pygmies were spread all over a great deal more of Africa than at present, and some of them were the first people to enter Egypt. All right, we have um, C.N. in D. Roa reports in the right use of will that the Lemurians were small and brown people, referring to the pygmies. All right. So, we are talking about the oldest indigenous people on the face of the earth and their descendants and the so-called Africans or blacks, Moors, or the descendants of the pygmies, direct descendants. And if you watch National Geographic, they did a DNA testing around the world, um, also Central Park, in which that they tested um, so-called, let's say we used the crayon colors in the box, black, brown, red, yellow, and white. And they told everyone um, that was um, white, yellow, um, brown, red, that they all come from the blacks, okay? And that they all came from out of Africa or from African people. Now, of course, Louis B. Leakey and Richard Leakey, his son, leaked that out back in the 1950s that um, according to anthropology and archaeology that Africans or blacks are the oldest people on the planet. Now, when we look at the United Nations definition of indigenous, it states those people have a historical continuancy with pre-invasions and pre-colonial societies consider themselves distinct from other sectors of the societies now prevailing in those territories or parts of them. They form at present as a non-dominant sector of society and are determined to preserve, develop, and transmit to future generations their ancestral territories and their ethnic identity as the basis of their continued existence as people in accordance with their own cultural patterns, social institutions, and legal systems. Now, you read the Inter-American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People um, approved um, at 1278 session, and it was held on September the 18th, 1995. Section 1 speaks of indigenous peoples and gives its definition in Article 1. It says, in this declaration, indigenous people are those who continue or embody, excuse me, historical continuancy with societies which existed prior to the conquest and settlement of the territory of their territories by Europeans, as well as people born involuntarily to the new world who freed themselves and reestablished the culture from which they have been torn. So let's look at that again. Number one, it says in this declaration, indigenous people, all right, let's look at this. In this declaration, indigenous people are those who continue historical, embody historical continuancy with societies which existed prior to the conquest and settlement of their territories by Europeans. All right? So that's one. Alternative one. It says, as well as people brought involuntarily to the New World who freed themselves and reestablished the culture from which they have been torn. Now, so they speak first about those people who was already here prior to those who was born from Africa, but even those who was born from Africa are also regarded as indigenous people. Why? Because of what we just finished talking about, that the anthropologists and archaeologists have determined that the oldest people on the face of the planet are Africans or black people, i.e. Moors. Okay? So this is why in both, um, in the definition of indigenous people, it gave those who was already here prior to the Europeans or prior to Columbus coming here in 1492 and others, as well as those who was brought involuntarily to the New World, who freed themselves. Of course, we would say those are be the Africans who came here more than 400 years ago. All right? Um, so I'm saying 1555 to, of course, 1619. All right? 
and supposedly, according to the 1619 reports, there was 20 slaves in which that came from Africa. Of course, if you get other books in which that we're going to a little bit later here, um, it also gives other credence. But it also states here, alternative two, as well as those, excuse me, as well as tribal people whose social, cultural, economic conditions distinguish them from other sectors of the national community and whose statue or status, excuse me, is regulated wholly or partially by their own custom or traditions or by special law or regulations. Now check this out, Article 2 states, self-identification as indigenous or tribal shall be regarded as a fundamental criteria for determining the group to which the provisions of this declaration applies. Self-identification. That means when you join an indigenous group, and those who identify themselves as being indigenous, for example, Washita, who are listed at the United Nations as the oldest indigenous people on the face of the earth, being direct descendants from the Twa people or the Pygmies, as they as misnomer. Self-identification. In other words, you must have your own identification method and process. Now, this correlates to the laws in this country, as colorable as they are. If you read the rule of evidence, federal law as well as state law, um, 901 and 902, it speaks specifically about self-identification. And how do you self-identify? Number one, you need witnesses, notary, um, ancient documents, newspapers, um, clips, or articles, as well as other information, and it can be in an affidavit or notice form in which that you can get filed um, privately within your own society, as well as also publicly, being that publicly you might still operate within the realm of commerce. But state laws also state the same as the rules of evidence. So that means when you go to court and if you're indigenous, number one, the judge will have to prove jurisdiction over the matter, whether it's the subject matter or whether it's the person matter or to ter um, territorial matter. Those are three of the reasons. But um, he cannot prove either of the, either of the three in all truthfulness. All right. The third article says the use of the term peoples in this instrument should not be construed as having any implication with respect to any other rights that might be attached to the term in international law. Now, when you read the United Nations, the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, that was passed by 144 nations on September the 7th through 13th of 2007, these rights or these articles are guaranteed that these natural indigenous rights be carried through by the people who identify themselves um, as in being indigenous. And Article 2 states that indigenous people and individuals are free and equal to all other people and individuals and have the right to be free from all kinds of discrimination in the exercise of their rights, in particular that base um, of their indigenous origin or identity. Article 4, indigenous people in exercising their right of self-determination have the right to autonomy or self-government in matters relating to their internal and local affairs, as well as ways and means for financing their autonomous functions. In other words, we have the right to form our own consular courts or tribunals, councils, in which that is able to go forth and deal with uh, matters concerning our um, nationals. Article 6. Every indigenous individual have the right to a nationality. Article 9. Indigenous people and individuals have the right to belong to an indigenous community or nation in accordance with the traditions and customs of the community or nation concerned. No discrimination of any kind may arise from the exercise of such a right. So, as indigenous, you have the right to belong to a community or a nation. Article 13. 
Indigenous people have the right to revitalize, use, develop, and transmit to future generations their histories, languages, oral traditions, philosophies, writing systems, and literature, and to designate and retain their own names for communities, places, and persons. So you have the right to have your own name in your community, as well as also when you go into other places and meet other persons. And it says, states shall take effective measures to ensure that these rights is protected and also to ensure that the indigenous people can understand and be understood in political, legal, and administrative processes where necessary through the provisions of interpretation or by other appropriate means. Now, being that we do not have our own tribunal or consular courts um, set up, um, of course we're working on that, and we should be working very hard on that. But right now, they're not where they're supposed to be or need to be. When you have to go to court, um, real simple, you were sending your paperwork prior to you going and state that you were there under TDC, threat to arrest or coercion, and you um, are making a special or restricted appearance in the court and make sure that you send that notice to the judge prior to going. In other, in other words, what you're doing is um, stating your nationality and status for the record. All right? Now, Article 33 Indigenous people have the right to determine their own identity or membership in accordance with their customs and traditions, meaning you have the right to make your own identification cards, nationality cards. So that's the temple, um, the Moore Science Temple of America has been doing now for nearly um, 100 years. All right, we have that ability to do so whether we're in the temple or not, we have that ability to do so because this falls up under, once again, the rules of evidence at the federal level, well, first at the international level, at the federal level, as well as also at the state level. This does not impair the rights of, in, of indigenous individuals to obtain citizenship of the state in which that they live. Indigenous people have the right to determine the structures and to select the membership of those institutions in accordance with their own procedures. So this is the problem in which that we're seeing is that you see many different procedures in each group, tribe, society, nation, are claiming that they have the one perfect procedure, and all of them are lying if they tell you that. There is no silver bullet in none of this. You get this information, and you work the laws. You internalize the information just in case if you don't have the paperwork on you. Or if you do have the paperwork, it would be verification for what you are stating. Go back to the movie Roots. In one of the scenes, and it's been a long time, um, I recommend that you go back and look at this. If you remember the scene when Toby ran away, uh, this is before he got his foot cut off, but in the scene right before that, he ran away. And the overseers, officers, was looking for Toby, and they came upon a black man and his black son. And I'm saying black, you know, because that's how we looked at them based on how we was raised and based on how we was trained to think. And however, Toby, who was black or African, who ran away from the plantation, and here they are coming upon, who came upon a black man and a black and his black seed or son, and they had their horse and buggy. They owned something. See, the thing is that Toby couldn't own anything because he was property. Property can't own property. But here, this black man and black child, his son, own a horse and a buggy. And the overseer, the overseers, it was two of them, white or pale, as, just, um, as I would say, 
um, there's, even in the Black Law Dictionary, there's a difference between white person and free white person. White person do not mean that they are free because in the definition of free white person, Caucasians and Aryans are not listed. So those who call themselves the Aryan race or who or the KKK, and they refer to themselves as Caucasians, they are not free either. They are slaves. <laughs> and this is the funny part about that, that they don't even know the um, the terminology either. But they are now listed as free white persons in the definition of free white person by Black's Law Dictionary, 4th edition, deluxe edition, that is. However, the overseer asked him for his papers, and he pulls out the papers, and he hands him his papers. And the overseer throws the papers back at him, and they continue on after Toby. So what is it, or what was it, and was that Alex Haley was trying to convey to us since he was the writer and author of the movie? What was he trying to convey to us is that one apparent-looking Negro or black, African, did not have papers, could not read, ran off the plantation, and the overseer had to come and get him because he was property, while another had papers in order to obviously to distinguish himself from from being property and that he was able to own property, and obviously he was free in order to travel, you know, however he needed his papers in order to do so, but, you know, that was fine based on the fact that at least he did not get his foot cut off but this is what um, was being conveyed, that we're looking at a Negro or African Negro, and we're looking at an African Moor, two Africans, but yet one free, one enslaved. Now, if you go to Article 44, it says, all the rights and freedoms recognized herein are equally guaranteed to male and female indigenous individuals. Now, when we go to the definition of American, you will see that does not include Caucasians nor Aryans either. According to Webster Universal Dictionary 1936, edition defines an American as an aboriginal or one of the various copper-colored natives found on the American continent by the Europeans, the original application of the name. Now, if you get the Universal, the Webster Universal Dictionary 1937 edition, it defines an American as an aboriginal or one of the various copper-colored natives found on the American continent by the descent of European settlers. The following is the original application of the name Maru. So, the word American is derived from the name Maru, and the word Maru is um, the Egyptian letters of M and R, which in owl, which um, the M is, symbol, is um, symbolized in Metuneta as an owl, and hence the reason why the owl um, is on the back of your, is on the front of your dollar bill in the upper right hand corner of the one, and um, the owl is also from the Capitol building, the Capitol building. And the area around the Capitol building is designed um, in an owl-shaped head. And, of course, we know who designed Washington, D.C. That was Benjamin Banneker, Ben Bay Emanuel Moali, a.k.a. Prince Hall. Now, the R is the mouth of Ra, which is the, actually a symbol of Tahuti, being that he was the word in which that was made flesh, which is the same as within the New Testament of Jesus being the word that was made flesh. But MR becomes the word guardian and is also the word more. You can throw two vowels in there because remember the ancient um, Egyptians did not use vowels or the Kemites or the Kemal or the Tamarians or Tamarians did not use vowels. So you can have two R's. So it becomes M O O R or M-U-U-R, or M-O-R-E, or M-O-R-U, or M-E-R-U, or M-A-R-U. It doesn't matter. 
the M and R or consonants in the word consonants is based from the word constant. And the word constant means that which remains the same. This is what many are failing to understand when it comes to linguistics and etymology and language and grammar. So, actually, America is named after the Moors, such as the term Timorians and Sumerians and Lemurians. These are all named after Moor. And who are the ancient Moors? They are the Twa people, the Pygmies. We just finished reading that they came from um, Hidden Life of in Freemasonry of Freemasonry by Charles Churchward. He says that the Lemurians, that the Twa people are the Lemurians, or the Pygmies are the Lemurians. Now, for those who do occult studies, of course, you might say that, um, for those who don't know, um, say that uh, Lemuria didn't exist. But we know what Lemuria actually, what they was really referring to. They were talking about the lemurs, a type of monkey. Of course, they were not monkeys. We understand that. But they were talking about their statues of being small in a sense. But um, the Hawaiian Islands, the remnants of the Hawaiian Islands, at one time, those islands was uh, were actually one land mass a giant island before the volcanic activity took place in which that caused them to separate and which that you have now the Hawaiian Islands. But that was Lemuria or El Moria. This is why Maui, uh, which is from the word Kamau, which is the name for the ancient Kemite um, or Hemite or Kemetic people. And Kamau or Maui is still the capital today of Hawaii. This is all still shown within the ancient Egyptian culture through the Metuneta. And for those that don't know, once again, um, Akan, Ifa, um, you know, as they refer to it as the Akan, the language Akan, as well as also Yoruba, um, Igbo, they are all derivatives of the Metuneta. Matter of fact, um, a con is high as 98% Metuneta still today. All right, and you can talk to any real scholar in West African language, and they would tell you that the African languages in which that they use Igbo, Yoruba, a con, and others, those are. Metuneta languages. They are the sacred words or sacred tongues of God. In other words, the speech of Tahuti, Hiru Kahuti, or Hir Kur. This is what we are talking about here. All right? Now, let's go on. Now, when you read what they never told you in history class, written by Indu Kimikush, um, the first Americans were blacks. All right? This is the um, chapter. It's on page 234 of his book. And he says, the scholarly Latin author, C.C. McQuise, explains the strong possibility that black people were the first people in America out of which later came the red American race. In other words... Um, the red man, or actually who was actually brown, um, came out of the black race. Matter of fact, he says, it is likely that we repeat the long ago that the youthful America was also a Negro continent and that the Altamese, which is talking about the Omex of Mexico, um, the Corolla Code of Haiti, the Arawak, and the uh, Matanas of Brazil and the albinos of Panama or the remains of the aborig aboriginal Negroes race out of which developed later what is known as the red or American race. Now, we just gave you the definition of American, and it says aboriginal copper-colored natives 
where it says here, Aboriginal Negro race out of which later developed, which is known as the Red or American race. But we know that the um, Red man um, referred to misnomered as Indians. But if you ever go and see the Indians prior to the 1900s, they were blacks, very dark-skinned Native Americans, especially the ones on the eastern seaboard, the northern um, portions of Detroit, Chicago area, into the south, southern area, and into California. They were very dark. Now, when you have the ones who came from the Barren Straits, because we did not come through the Barren Straits, we were here millions and billions of years ago before the continental drift. The continental drift is said to have occurred, according to geologists, all right, um, 200 million years ago. But I just finished showing you in Forbidden Archaeology, the hidden history of the human race, that in Dorchester, Massachusetts, 600 million years ago, we were smelting metal right here in North America, in the United States of America, in Massachusetts. So that means that we was already here prior to the continental drift occurring. Remember, no one's been on this planet longer than we have, and everyone else is a byproduct of the interaction or the intermingling of what we made in the laboratory um, more than 6,000 years ago. And you can get this from the Moral Science Temple of America and the Adept Chamber information. You can get this from um, the Nation of Gods and Earths and their 120. You can get this from the student enrollment of the Nation of Islam, as well as also within the Rosicrucians, as well as also within um, certain Masonic lore. All right, this this is a little known um, fact. All right, and what I mean by that is that we're talking about beings who actually are a mixture of the chimpanzee monkey or having monkey genes and um, albino, all right, or Nubian or Moorish albinos in which they help incubate in order to bring um, what we refer to as um, the Caucasian or European race into existence. All right, and so we're talking about billions and millions of years ago in which that at that time period there was still only one race of people on the planet Earth. It wasn't until thousands of years ago, and we're talking about less than 20,000 years ago, even according to scientists when they speak about the Neanderthal man, that the Neanderthal man died out um, over the last ice age less than 10,000 years ago, and his descendants um, or in, and his descendants were white people. And they have tested the African genes, and they found that the cannibals, known as the Neanderthal man, those genes do not reside in African people. Now, of course... They can reside within African people if you mix in and mix your genes, and this might be the reason why that was spoken of within the Bible in that regard, not to mix your, not to mix your genes. But this is what they was actually referring to. So we hear that the first, we see here that the first Americans were black. And Professor um, Alexander Von Wittenew, he, spe he speaks or states within unexpected faces in ancient America, and he add how black people were present in America in the most ancient or pre-classical times. The startling fact is that in all parts of Mexico, archaeological pieces represent Negro and Negroid people have been found, especially in archaic or pre-classic sites. The presence of Negroes with their trading masters in um, America before Columbus, states Professor Leo Weiner, is proof is proved by the representation of Negroes in America, sculptures and designs, but most specifically by Columbus 
emphatical reference to Negro traders from Guinea who traffic in gold alloys, guani, or precisely the same composition and hearing of the same name as frequently referred to by early writers in Africa. And this is from his book, Africans and Africa and the Discovery of America. All right. In this regard, the testimony of Nicholas Leon proves instructive on how um, ancient and African presence was in or, um, or were in America. In fact, he say that black people were the original people of Mexico. The almost extinction of the original Negroes during the time of the Spanish conquest and the memory and the memories of them in the most ancient traditions induce us to believe that the Negroes were the first inhabitants of Mexico. And this is from the book History, um, the Journal of History of Mexico, written in 1919. As well as also um, Riva Palacio, a Mexican scholar, stresses the point. It is indistinguishable that in very ancient times the Negro race occupied our territory, Mexico. The Mexicans recall a Negro god, um, Ishlikton, which means black face. As right, a matter of fact, Ish is the name of the jaguar. And that was the name, Ishlikton, uh, Ish which means black face. All right. Matter of fact, Quasicorto, which means the plume serpent. Um, Corto means black also. Okay. Um, also, Colonel A. Bracken said that he saw in collection of in Ecuador a statuette of a Negro that is at least twenty thousand years old. He adds, some statues of the Indian gods in Central America possess typical Negro features and certain prehistorical monuments there undoubtedly represents Negroes. This is from his book, The Shadows of Atlantis, page 40, 42, 1940, it was read. All right. And, of course, we know that we have at least 20-some-odd heads, gigantic heads of the Olmec in which that has been found, in which that weighs over five tons. All right. Um, there's a replica in which that my wife and I have seen um, in the American Museum of Natural History in New York, as well as when we went to Cancun um, along this strip, going towards um, Chesenisa, Cobal, and Tulum. Um, you will see heading out or coming into town of Cancun, you also see a uh, replica of that five ton or more head all right of the Olmec deity or the black gods of ancient America okay um then we have the fitting statement was made by professor Wiener Leon Wiener a matter of fact he was a Harvard professor all right and graduate of Harvard University but um in his book Africans and Discovery of America he shows how the culture of Africa so closely resembled the African uh, of America, excuse me, so closely resembled the African culture that one must conclude that the African origin of America. The identity of the spiritual civilizations down to the remotest detail in the um in the Sudan and in Mexico and elsewhere in America leads to the assumption that other cultural elements identity um um identical in both continents and frequently bearing the same name as um or of African origin. And lastly, um, R.J. J. Ross Bodhi, um, in his book African, um, excuse me, Ancient Egyptians and Chinese in America, he points out that the blacks, that the black began his career in America not as slave but as master. All right, another article by Diane Worth, um, Afro Americans in Pre-Columbian Mexico. I won't read the whole article, but 
Um, here she says, both pieces are in the room of the museum which contains sculptures from Vera Cruz. No information was given of these heads, but they are clearly of Negro black race, Negro black race. Numerous other portraits of Negro people, Negro people in Mesoamerica can be found in two books by Alexander von Wittenau, The Art of Terracotta Pottery in Pre-Columbian Central and South America, and The Unexpected Faces in Ancient America. All right, Wittenau has been criticized by numerous anti Diffusionists in the past, many of his photographs of the sculptures from private collections and cannot be authenticated. So this is why they want to say um, that. But um, also, um, she wrote, Diane Worth wrote the first Americans, red or black. All right. No, but that was in response to the first Americans, red or black, by um, Willard P. Louse. All right, and so she was um, proving that they were blacks here prior to, all right, the red man, as we would say. Now, what most people do not know is that there is a difference between an American Indian who is called full blood and who has predominantly Mongolian genes and then Native Americans who is pure blood, which is original Negro genes. All right, the people that you have seen today um, that have light skin, various um, shades from beige to red, and even some dark brown, of course, um, by mixing, have shovel teeth, oval um, features, and straight, circular, and hollow hair. Now, these are all traits were inherited from their Chinese ancestors, um, which is half their blood, and in most cases, the Mongolian gene dominates the Negro um, dominates the Negro genes, right? These um, um, American children are the children of the true Native Americans who were Negroids, or, as we would say, the Omex, who are known as the She People. All right. So yes, the original Native American tribes were all Negroids. The American Indians of today are a mixture of the Omex, the original Blacks, from the Negro roots. Um, and the Hexian, or the Hesushan, from China, as well as the Dravidians of East India, who crossed the Bering Strait and created the Aleutian, American Indian, related to the Eskimo, and the mixture of the East Indian and Oriental. So this is how they came into play. And you can get this from the article, We the People, uh, written in November 2003. All right. Let's go to um, David E. Stannard um, in his American Holocaust, Columbus and the Conquest of the New World. Um, he said America, the oldest civilization known in the Americas, was the Omex, and it was of black Africoid origin and flourished over five over a five thousand year period. All right, this civilization existed in the, Amer in the Americas before the arrival of the Red Indians. In fact, at the time of the European arrival in Central and South America in the 1500s, descendants of black Omex were abounding throughout the region, particularly in Mexico. And this is what he says. Now, that was from Oxford University Press, 1992. All right. Now, you get another book called the Sousa Economics, the history of Pan-American trade, commerce, money, and wealth. These blacks found in the Americas. This is first books, library, states the mound builders. They were black-skinned, woolly-haired blacks who were indigenous, natives to North America and kin to the Omex of South America. The Omex in Washington, black Californians, who is known as the Californian, Nami, um, the Yamases, and the other pre-Columbian blacks of America were part of a prehistoric trade network that began in Africa and spread it worldwide over 100,000 years ago at a various at various periods afterwards. All right, now that was a that was um, at least 100,000 years ago. 
right? We know that blacks been here prior to that, but they're talking about as far as trade and commerce, it, um, that they've been doing this between Africa, um, India, and America, been doing this back and forth for at least over 100,000 years. Now, you have a Muslim historian and geographer, um, Abdul Hassan Ali Ibn Al Hassan um, Al Masudi wrote in his book, um, The Maruk Ad Dahab Wa Madin Al Jahad, which is known as the Metals of Gold and Quarry of Jewelry or Jewels, um, that during the rule of the Muslim Caliph of Spain, Abdullah Ibn Muhammad of eight. 880, 912, a Muslim navigator um, by the name of Said um, Ibn Aswad of Cordoba, Spain, sailed from Dalaba, which is Palos, in 889, crossed the Atlantic, reaching an unknown territory, and returned with fabulous treasures. All right? And, um, Al Masudi map of the world, there is a large area in the in the ocean of darkness and fog, the Atlantic Ocean, which he refers to as unknown territory, the Americas. Right? Then you had um another Muslim historian by the name of um Abdul um Abu Bak um Ibn Ab um Udmar Al Gutia. You know, who narrated that during the reign of the Muslim, of the Muslim Caliph um, of Spain, Hashem II, um, 976 through 1009, um, another Muslim navigator, Ibn Farouk of Granada, sailed to Kadesh on um, February 999 um, into the Atlantic, landed in Gando, which is the Great Canary Islands, Visiting King on Grenan Rigo and continued westward where he saw and named two islands called um, Capria and Politana. And he arrived back in Spain in May of um, 999. Now, he sailed even further westward. So we can assume that those two islands um, could have possibly been um, part of the Caribbean. Now, on October the 12th, 1492, Columbus landed on a small island in the Bahamas that was called um, Gonadhana, or Gonahani, um, by the natives, renamed um, San Salvador by Columbus, All right, in which that... Um, they speak of the Mandinga, all right, um, in which that uh, Fernandez Columbus, the son of um, of Christopher Columbus, wrote that the blacks seen by his father in Honduras, the people who live further east of Point Covinas, as far as Cape Gracios and Dios, were almost black in color. At the same time, in this very same region lived a tribe of Muslims, native known as Alamani, al Almami. In the Mandika, in Arabic language, Almani was designated as Al Imam or Al Imanu, the person who leads the prayers, or in some cases, the chief of the community and or member of the Imami um, Muslim community. Okay? Now, also, a um, Leo Winner, again, um, in his African and, um, discovery of America 1920, he wrote that Columbus was well aware of the Mendico presence in the New World and that the West African Muslims had spread it throughout the Caribbean, Central, South, and North American territories, including Canada, where they was trading and intermarrying with the Iroquois and Algonquin Indians. Now, for those who don't know who the Iroquois are, they still exist today as the Chicakoi, who are known as the Cherokee. Okay. 
Okay, and the Cherokee are still to this very day the largest tribe, but yet they have asserted our birthright once again and now have been infiltrated. The Cherokee has been infiltrated with damn near um, white people who sits on the council and sits at the helm and have begun to try and who have been trying for years to ostracize um, the said black Cherokee. But when the when they were the original people. All right. All right. Anthropologists have proved have proven that the Mandingos under Mansa Musa instructions explore many parts of North America via the Mississippi and other river systems. So when um Nobudrali says that there was Moors who lived up and down the Mississippi, this is who he was referring to. At four corners Arizona, right, and shows that there are even that they even brought elephants from Africa to the area. All right. Now that's in Arizona. Now who lived in Arizona? You have the Fosums, who lived in Arizona over seventy-five thousand years ago, and they are black also. Columbus admits in his papers that on May, October the twenty-first, fourteen ninety-two, while he, um, while his ship was selling near Gaborah or on the northern east coast of Cuba, as he called it, Isabella, he saw a mosque on top of a beautiful mountain. The ruins of the mosque and the minaret was inscriptions of Arabic or Quranic verses have been found in Cuba, Mexico, Texas, Nevada, Arizona. During his second voyage, Columbus was told by the Indians of Española, which is Haiti, Right, or hate time that black people have been on the islands before his arrival. For proof, they presented Columbus with spears of these African Muslims. So the Moors were there. Now, you get Dr. Barry Falls, also another Harvard University graduate, um, introduces in his book, The Saga America. In 1980, solid scientific evidence supporting the arrival centuries before Columbus of Muslims from North and West Africa. Dr. Fells discovers the existence of Muslim schools at um, Valley of um, Fire, Allen Springs, um, Keyhole Canyon, the Washoe. Now, the Washoe, if you don't know, or the Washoe the Lago um, Morsino, the Hixion. Um, Summit Pass, which is Nevada, Mesa Verdes, which is Colorado, the Membres Valley, which is New Mexico, and the Tipper Canoe, which is Indiana, all are dating back to 700 to 800 A.D. So they say that Islam was given to Prophet Muhammad he was born in 570, around 570, and he died um, around 10, um, um, 610. Well, excuse me, 610 is when he received the Holy Quran, and he died um, 10 years later, supposedly around 10, um, 620, somewhere around that time, somewhere around there. But here it is. He died in the 600s, and then by less than 100 years later, 700 um, through 800, less than 100 to 100 and some odd years, engraved on rocks in the old western United States. He found texts, diagrams, and charts representing the last surviving fragment of what was once a system of schools at both elementary and higher learning or higher level. The language of, in, of, in, of, um, of instructions was North Afri of North African Arabic, written with old Kufic, Arabic script. The subject of instructions include writing, reading, arithmetic, religion, geography, history, mathematics, astronomy, and sea navigation. The descendants of the Muslim visitors of North America are members of the present Iroquois, Algonquin, Anasi, 
Hokokam, and Omec native people. There are 565 names of places, villages, towns, cities, mountains, lakes, rivers, etc. in the United States. 484 and in Canada, 81, which are derived from Islamic and Arabic roots. Moorish names, or Moors names. Their place their places were originally named by the natives in the pre-Columbian period. Some of these names carry holy meanings such as Mecca, India, or Indiana. 720 inhabitants. Um, Mecca um, Indian tribe, Washington, Medina, um, Idaho, 2,100. Um, um, Medina, New York, 8,500. Medina and Hassan. North Dakota, 1,100 and 5,000, respectively. Medina, Ohio, 12,000. Medina, Tennessee, 1,100. Medina, Texas, 26,000. Medina, Ontario, 1,200. Mohammed, Illinois, 3,200. Mona, Utah, 1,100. Ava, Ontario, 700, and many others. A careful study of the names of the native in um, um Indigenous tribes reveal the many names are derived from Arabic and Islamic roots and origins. So that includes the Ashkenazi, the Apache, the Arawak, the Rikana, the Calvin um, Cherokee, um, the Crete, the Hokokem, um, the Yupa, um, the Hoopa, the Hopi, the Mecca, the Mahingang, the Mohawk, the Nazca, the Zulu, the Zuni, etc. All right. Now, I mean, it's amazing also that you have the Zulu uh, from out of um, Africa, but you also have the Zulu, um, which is a Native American tribe that was here in the United States also. That's no coincidence. Well, that might be explained. Jack D. Forbes, in his book entitled Africans and Native Americans, page 68, he states that in 1524, the people of the Carolina coast were said to be of dark color, not much unlike the Ethiopians. Also in the Charlotte Observer here in North Carolina, dated Sunday, August the 15th, 1993, states that North Carolina in 1690 reports the presence of Moors and that they were, that they are the um, ancestors of a people erroneously called Melungeons. So the misnomer Melungeon is a cover up once again the death of birthright in which that alludes back to the Moors once again. Now if you don't understand who you are, let's look at the executive order one one four nine zero, October nineteenth, nineteen sixty nine, which is the called the King Alfred Plan, which became the Rex eighty four plan because in nineteen eighty four uh, Ronald Reagan signed the Rex 84 plan into existence, which dealt with the concentration camps. Executive Order 11490 expanded top secret silent weapons for quiet wars, introduction, um, manual, operational research, technical manual, TM SW 7905.1. Um, the following excerpts text is derived from a few pages which are extracted from the limitly released top secret um, introductory program and manual um, and documents which have been known and published as the Executive Order 11490. Preliminary memo, Department of Defense, says this memo is being submitted in lieu of a full report for the Joint Chief of Staff. Their report is now in preparation there will be many cities which the minorities, remember they refer to us as the minorities, even though we outnumber them 18 to 1, will be well to put in the streets a superior number of people with a desperate and dangerous will. He will be a formidable enemy, for he is bound to this continent by heritage. Once again, he is bound to this continent by heritage. One more time, he is bound to this continent by heritage and knows that the political asylum would not be available to him in any other countries. The greater concentration of the minorities is in the Deep South, the Eastern Seaboard, the Great Lake region, and the West Coast. 
which happens to be the same places in which that I just made earlier, that there was always the darker Native Americans ex- who existed in those land areas who were actually the mound builders and the pyramid builders on the planet Earth. If this was not true, then why would they not let you be free for you can go and build your own society? They are afraid of you, so they have to keep you oppressed, suppressed, and depressed. They are afraid of you. Why else would they have programming, had to have genetically altered food, mind control tactics, had to control every facet of your life from entertainment, law, sex, um, politics, education, religion, so forth and so on. Get Dr. Neely Fuller's Confrontation of White Supremacy and Francis Quest Wilson's ISIS paper. They go into it that the European or the white man specifically fears genetically annihil- um, genetic annihilation. So in that regard, um, he holds you down because of that um, ultimate um, realization that he will not exist because our genes are dominant. And this is, you can get this from Dr. Gregory Mendels, who is the European rediscoverer of the genetics, in which that he has the Punnett Square, in which that speaks about the big B, big B, big B, little B, little B, big B, and little B, little B. We are big B, big B. Our genes are dominant, which means superior. The albions of those who lack melanin um, has weaker genes. Inferior. So hence, little B, little B. When we mix, then the genes becomes big B, little B, or little B, big B. In other words, they have the trait of dominancy, but also have the trait of recessivity. But anyway, let's focus on this. He will be a formidable opponent or enemy, for he is bound by this continent by heritage. He is bound by this continent by heritage. What does heritage mean? Well, let's go to Webster New Universal Unbridge Dictionary. Heritage. To inherit. Inheritance. Property that is and can be inherited. Something handed down from one ancestor or the past as a characteristic, a culture, tradition, etc. by the right. Burden or status resulting from being born in a certain um, place, time, a birthright. So heritage is a birthright. So that means that we are bound by this continent by heritage, but it means that we are bound by this continent by a birthright. Well, this goes back to, this This reminds me of what Prophet Nobu Ali made a statement in which that, um, according to the um, Holy Quran Circle 7, um, in the chapter dealing with um, Egypt, the capital empire of the dom- dominion of Africa, uh, of um, it says the Moabites from the land of Moab who received permission from the pharaohs of Egypt to settle and inhibit northwest Africa. They were the founders and the true possessors of the present Moroccan empire. All right, now, this is the Moroccan empire here. Okay? This is the Moroccan empire out of Morocco or Amerika. Uh, Marika, all right, and Northwest Africa, this is here. If you get um, prior to the 200 million years ago and you get Pangea or Asia or Mu, you would see all of the land masses together in which that North America actually um, sits on top of Africa at the Northwest section. So it says, with their Canaanite, Hittite, and Amorite brethren, who sojourned from the land of Canaan, seeking new homes. Their domain and habitation extended from northeast and southwest um, Africa across the great Atlantis, even unto the present north, south, and central America, and also Mexico and the Atlantean islands before the great earthquake, which caused the great Atlantic Ocean. All right, so this gives the verification in which that Prophet Nobajali is talking about and is very being and it has been verified by everything in which I've been talking about. <clears throat> this is about truth and the fact is is that um that's the one thing that truth can't be defeated. So, you know, all the opinions is um as we know, it's just like assholes. Everyone has one. But when it comes to the matter of the truth, um, 
you have to deal with facts, and that's what I've been presenting tonight. So, um, you know, um, as far as I'm concerned, that's what it is. You know, let's go to the phone lines. We have some questions. Starting out 302, area code 302, you're on the line. 302, you're on the line. Peace. All right, we're going to um, question 3013, excuse me, 313, area code 313. Area code 3103, 313, you're on the line. 313. Peace. Peace. Okay, uh, hey, this is uh, Air Code 313 up here. Yeah, am I making the connection, Blau? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, could you uh, uh, get, get, give me information on, um, um, is it Charlotte, North Carolina, and the Mecken, Meckenberry County? Meckenberry, um, Can you give mm-hmm. any um, Knowledge on the ancestry of the Mecklenburgs. Am I pronouncing that right, Mecklenburg? Yes, Mecklenburgs. Yes. Um, well, Queen Charlotte Sophia, uh, Queen Sophia Charlotte, um, depends on whichever you know history text was that you get. She was up to Mecklenburg, and so hence um, that was part of her family um, lineage in which that in Charlotte, North Carolina, was actually named after her. Um, hence the reason why it's called the Queen City. But um, if you do your research, you will find out that Queen Sophia Charlotte was actually the wife of King George um, um, during the so-called um, Revolution um, period. Um, he was the um, king during that time period. Or any, um, her and King George both was Moors. Um, if you get Sex and Race by J. Rogers, Volume 1, um, he shows an actual picture of Queen Charlotte. And, of course, you can do your own research on that, too. And also, um, um, the people that are sitting a uh, bench right now um, are they um, claiming um, her heritage or descendancy from um, Queen Charlotte? Yes, matter of fact, um, Queen Elizabeth is um, the great great granddaughter, um, the great 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 granddaughter, excuse me, of Queen um, Sophia Charlotte. Yes, so they'll they'll um, those who are sitting on the royal line are what we refer to as twenty moors. In other words, they are bleached out moors. Wow. Right. Now, if you get um, if you go and find the ancient terminology for the word black, um, it get kind of confusion um confusing because um originally black fifteen hundred years ago um, meant um, bleach or blanc which also could be for, referred to as white. Okay, okay, another reconstruction. So that's, that's why, it was, um, that's why um, the word black was, um, was limitedly, you know, was used limitedly, you know, when it came to um, uh, when Prophet Nubadur Ali was saying that we're not Negro, blacks, and coloreds or Ethiopians because those words um, get kind of confusing, and then they also are descriptive words, which means that they are adjectives. And adjectives um, describe the things, but in order to be a proper noun, you must have a proper name. So hence, that's when you can stand in proper persona sejuris. You can't be in proper, um, proper um, persona sejuris without a proper name or a designation. And the court system in which that you'll, you'll see as I go continue going through the information here, um, how they don't recognize generic terms. You know, they need a specific term. You must identify yourself specifically. So this is what we're going to continue going into um, tonight, discussion. Okay, okay. Uh, thanks for right. the information. Thanks for the information. Well, you're welcome. All right. Peace and blessings, brother. Peace. All right, area code 302. Area code 302, you're on the line. You're on the line, area peace. code 302. Peace, peace. Peace, this is Brother Messiah. I just, I just kind of wanted to add on to something you said earlier. Yes, Brother, cut in. In regards to um, nationality and 
uh, you know, how it relates to pedigree as opposed to, you know, various temple holding that birthright. Because, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, like I was communicating to you uh, last week, I ran into a brother on Facebook, and he was sitting there trying to tell me that uh, in order for you to obtain nationality as a Moor, you got there's a process that you get that you have to go through through the more science temple. So, you know, I'm, I know you can't, you can tell that to a fool. You can't tell that to me. Number one, the more science temple is a corporation. They can't possibly hold the birthright to a natural human being. You get what I'm saying? So this is the way he's making it seem. He's making it seem like, I don't even know more science temple you represent, first and foremost, but he's making it seem as though the more science temple is holding his birthright, and then at the same time he's down talking to other morals, including yourself. Yeah, but um, as you know, um, I don't care um, because um, you want to defeat the information, defeat the truth. I'm just a vessel for the truth. Defeat the truth. Absolutely you can't be, not. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, um, anything in which that I've mentioned proved me wrong. I mean, how many books have I given out and scholars that I've given out already just within the last hour? Hundreds. Hundreds. So, I mean, um, we're talking about books, scholars, um, lectures, you know, um, lecturers, you know, speakers, you know, authors, writers, you know, um, geologists, anthropologists, archaeologists, who have all verified everything in which I'm saying, and plus the teachings of Prophet Nobudrali. Exactly. And I'm not doing it no and I'm not doing it in a spooky way either. Exactly. And I'm not asking anybody to say that this is the only way when the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People says that is based on the procedures of your community and of your nation. So if the Moore Science Temple of America is a community and they're part of the community, then that's their procedure. It's I would not interfere brother. with their procedure. That's their procedure. It might not be necessarily the procedures of other societies, tribes, or groups, or nations. It depends on where everyone is in their consciousness. If that's where they are within their consciousness, and that is to um, worship Prophet Nobudrali, you know, or to, um, you know, uh, the, you know, the, you know, to think that. You know, we just got here 400 some odd years ago on a ship. You know, then that is, you know, where they are at right now. Nothing I can do about that is to present truth in which that they must rebut sooner or later. And they can't rebut it so soon they will not exist if they do not get with the program and get with the understanding and get with the teachings in order to teach their people the reality of this. So I don't care about all the hoopla. Like I said, everyone has an opinion, you know, just like, you know, everyone has an asshole. That's good. Exactly. You know, for him speaking things against someone, that's a violation of Article 3, if I'm not mistaken. So he's an asshole anyway. I told the brother, I said, listen, I said, how many ports do you own? Do you own any currency or whatever you represent, do they own any currency? As long as... As long as you don't own any of these various different things that a nation would own, then we ain't going to never have none because we can't even come together and agree on one thing. Right. Last, last I checked, we all, we all striving to uplift all humanity. You that's what we're supposed to be doing. Go ahead, go ahead. No, I'm just saying that's what we're supposed to be doing. Exactly. You can't do that by sitting there bad mouth and other people who's striving to do the same thing. He's telling me I'm not no Moorish American. <laughs> I said, Oh, you may want to look well, at your one on one. Well I, I gave I, you the defi- I, I gave I gave you the definition I, of an American. I emailed him. You are you are one of the him. copper colored natives of North America who were here prior to the conquest and the invasion of the Europeans. So how exactly. are you not an American? And how exactly. you're not a Moor when the word Moor, according to us, the dictionary means black also, or black exactly. or more, or one of dark complexion, of you know Arabic ancestry, which, of course, the original Arabs, you know, or the Ethiopians who went into Ethiopia, um, um, excuse me, who went into Saudi Arabia, 
as we refer to it as nowadays. And you, you know what else I told him in regard to that right there? When he started mentioning all this process stuff he was talking about, I said, did the Moors of 7-Eleven AD go through this process? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right, and I just finished mentioning um, Mansa Musa, who was a Moor. Exactly, and his descent and his people. Now, for those who don't know, Mansa Musa had over two hundred ships when he came over here, and they all and they did not come back. Hannibal, Mansa right. Musa, right. right. So this is the nonsense in which that's right. So this is the nonsense in which that's being perpetrated by those who are not scholars. I don't care about all the hoopla claiming that you are somebody. You're not a historian. You're not a scholar. Where where are your books at? Where are your lectures on the worldwide circuit? I've been to London. Requested to come to Germany. I've been to Canada. I've been all over the country. My shit is worldwide. <laughs> who who's this individual? Who stuck what? Stuck in what? Stuck in Virginia? I'm gonna put I'm gonna put the name out there, and I hope he's listening because I told him to tune in, and this is what started the whole conversation. And he probably ain't gonna tune in anyway. It's crazy. His name is Aline Bay with an Elishu in front of it, or Elisha, something like that. Elishu, right. Elishu. Right. The brother only thirty years old. Yeah, I know, I know, and, and that's I'm what I'm saying. And I know, I even know a brother who goes to the temple that he goes to down there in the part of, in uh, Newport News, Virginia. He stepped up out of that temple because he told me there's some stuff going on in there that he don't want no part of. He'd rather study at home. And I hope that well, brother is online tonight. You know who you are. Right. Well, I mean, um, the brother um, who he um, is up under is actually the son of um, Rasadi Il from out of the um, Moral Science Temple of 1928 out of Georgia, out of Atlanta, Georgia, mm-hmm. who is now, um, who is said to be the um, Supreme Grand Sheik or Chief Minister um, over the um, MSTA 1928. And that is his son, is Kasadi El, in which that um, Lishua um, Aline Bay, and claiming that he's the only Aline Bay. Well, shoot, and you know, I doubt that because I had this name ever since 1989. <laughs> and how old was his ass in 1989? <laughs> that's eight years. Huh? That's eight right. years. The brother born in right. 1981. Right. He, right, he was only eight years old, and he wasn't born into the Moore Science Temple. But that's how long I've been studying the more science temple information. Is eighty nine. So I mean, um, these individuals coming or Johnny Late comers and thinking that they um doing something because um Prophet Number Jale said that um it won't be until the third and fourth generation that the Moors would get this information and it would be until two thousand that the Moors would come into their own. And so they call themselves the new Moors. But if you coming in as a new mob with the old ideology, then you're not new. You're still relegating our people to the same nonsense, same oppression, suppression, and depression in which that's been propagated for the last hundred years or so by the infiltrators of the Moral Science Temple of America in the first place and those who caused the Great Schism. But that's enough said on that. Let's get back to the real information. Like I said, they can't defeat none of this, they can't defeat none of this shit anyway that I'm saying, so they might as well just shut the fuck up. All right, let's go to the next caller. Peace, God. All right, peace. All right, caller seven one um seven eight six. Call seven eight six. Yeah, peace and honor, blessing. Peace and honor. All, all gracious is due to all the holy ones that's bringing the truth, hurling the truth at the the first world order. And like what you said, brother, back in the day, Noble you all Lee warned that our own people would attempt and have done and put us right back. Right back into slavery. Slavery with their own foolishness that we keep on perpetrating with this pendulum going back and forth, and we can't figure this shit out. That's right. Now, and here's some documented facts that some of our people may want to tune into on Christ. You're my brother, you already know. This is Brother uh, uh, Aleem, uh, 
Al Malik L. D. right here in uh, Day County, Florida country, brother. All right. Uh, it was read June 6, uh, 1848, by uh, a judge. It, uh, he read it, uh, Judge uh, P.O. Uh, Mac- McCaleb. He declared that the United States of America did not own they did not own the land of the ancient ones of the the Washita, the mound builders of North America, which owns more than one million square miles. I'm talking one million over one million square miles, brother, and we already know. And guess what? The lawful landowners are the heirs of Henry Turner. Of oh, Henry Washita. Turner. Oh, Henry Turnica. That's right. Yes. It was a federally uh day reigning her highness, uh uh, various, uh, I can't pronounce the name correctly, but you know yeah, what I'm talking about. Right, Bertie Ossie, yeah. Pierre, um, um, Washita, Turnica, Gaston L. Bay. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Those documented proof and give us a hint to get our behinds out of our, our heads out of our minds. Like what you said in the past, we got to wipe our own asses and declare our nationality and stop some of the foolishness that's going on. Exactly. Come together in a exactly. critical, critical mass, and then we can start doing some of these things, like what you're saying, uh, doing our own currency, uh, uh, come together in our communities and form uh, uh, think tanks where we can do just like what the Albanians are doing towards us and plan 20, 25, and 30 years in advance so we can advance our places exactly. to do. And that, that, that ends my, 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 uh, my statement, brother. Man, that was a beautiful statement, brother. I appreciate you. Thank you. No, no problem, no problem. All right. Let's go to caller 347. Caller 347, you're on the line. Caller 347, you're on the line. All right. Um, We're going back to the information. All right, Brother Taj Tyreek Bay, who's also been, um, who's also been um, being bashed but yet can't defeat the truth. That's what I'm noticing. They can't defeat this information. But Taj Tariq Bey, who is um, an emir of the Great Seal National Association of Moorish Affairs, a grand sheik of the Moorish Science Temple of America, the Great Seal Moorish Science Temple of America, as well as also um, the founder of the Moors of the Round Table, he writes in his book, Who Are the Moorish American Moors Define? In his preface, he says, The truth is, these problems, a lack of self-esteem, a lack of jobs, a lack of education, and others seemingly related issues and or disciplines are but the symptoms, but not the root causes of oppression and the denial of citizen rights in this union, state, society, jurisdiction. The following are the major roots cause of the above stated problems. So if you want to know why we're being oppressed, suppressed, and depressed, this is what Brother Todd says, and you need to pay close attention to what I'm getting ready to say here. This is very important. He says a lack of knowledge of self, which ties to parentage through heritage and cultural orientation with sovereign rights to the land and its resources. This is why we're teaching this information tonight. A lack of de jure, true nationality a national flag, a national seal to solidify the distinction of the above in the international community. According to Black's Law Dictionary, 5th edition, nationality determines the political status of the individual, especially with reference to allegiance. Nationality derives from the noun nation, which derives from the word nature and native. So the term Negro, black, and colored are unnatural and are not contrary to our fundamental nature, which is divine. Three, a lack of birthright, self-authority, and heritage, land of resources, due to death by foreign and alien European colonial incorporated companies, states. A lack of sovereignty due to death of birthright and a lack of constitution, language, originating from self for national and international protections of sovereign citizen rights and immunities. Five, a lack of enough honest or knowledgeable true de jure representations or representatives of the people branded as black who are willing to admit to or tell the truths rather than capitalize 
on the profit or the profitable social and political opportunities open due to these civic rooms, wounds, i.e., like Jesse Jackass. He know this information. However, he will not show it, just like those Boulay members, in which that we talked about last week on the show, they will not show it. They will not demonstrate. They will not tell the people. They are not honest. So they cannot represent the people. And they choose not to represent the people because they call themselves the advisors to the kings, the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, and those so-called 13 Illuminati blood families. That's their allegiance. Now we have six, a commonly held attitude of um, cultivated, weak, and sluggish will. When the pressure of work, finance, and sacrifice becomes evidence to bring true de jure law and a teaching of sovereignty or sovereign capacity to this stage of reality, this weak tendency must be reversed with priorities clarified by proper civic instruction. Seven, above all, before any people can be recognized by the international community of nations, publicly declare your nationality. From this point, the rights and freedom sovereign process begins. No political oppressed people can raise from civic death without knowledge of nationality, birthright, and sovereignty. Now, if you don't understand this, then let me give it to you from what Martin Luther King said. In his book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community, which that's one of the books that they don't want you to read and which that has been out of print for some time now. You might be able to get it from um, half.com on eBay. Um, but he says, we're approaching an area where the voice of the Constitution is not clear. We have left the realm of constitutional rights, and we are entering the area of human rights. So even Martin Luther King was moving towards human rights. Malcolm X, in his speech, um, when he spoke on it, says Malcolm X speak on civil rights versus human rights. All right, Malcolm X um, state human rights comes before civil rights. We can never get civil rights until we have human rights. Human rights represents the rights to be human beings. Whenever you are respected and recognized as a human being, your civil rights are automatic. No, you have to get the recognition of human rights first. The Constitution classifies our people as three-fifths of a man, which meant subhuman not a complete human being. And once our human characteristics were completely destroyed, they gave them, they gave, that, this gave them justification for treating us like we were animals. Now remember this, because we're going to get into this in a minute. Then it also justified them selling us. The black man's human rights have been respected. He would never have been a slave here in America. And if he and if his human rights has been restored by the Emancipation Proclamation, automatically we would have been citizens after the Civil War. Now we know that we're not citizens because, according to the Dred Scott case, it states that we would never be citizens, and we are not citizens. So Malcolm goes on. So we must be regard, regarded as humans. Our human rights must be respected before we can ever be regarded as citizens, or civil rights be respected. Now, this is from his speech in the Ballad of the Bullet. Malcolm goes on, anytime you know you within the law, within your legal rights, within your moral rights, in accord with justice, then die for what you believe in. But don't die alone. Let your dying be reciprocal. That's what is meant by equality. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. When we begin to get in this area, we need new friends. We need new alliance or allies. We need to expand the civil rights struggle to a higher level, to the level of human rights. Wherever you, um, you are in a civil rights struggle, whether you know it or not, you are confining yourself to the jurisdiction of Uncle Sam. So and once again, you get outside the jurisdiction of Uncle Sam, hence by declaring your nationality. Hence, that give you international um, connections of human rights, up under the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. So Malcolm goes on, no one from outside world can speak in your behalf as long as you struggle 
as your struggle is civil rights struggle. Civil rights comes within the domestic affairs of this country. All of our African brothers and our Asian brothers and our Latin American brothers cannot open their mouths and interfere in the domestic affairs of the United States as long as it's civil rights. This comes under the jurisdiction of Uncle Sam, but the United Nations has what's, um, what's known as the Charter of Human Rights. It has a committee that deals in human rights. We may wonder why all the atrocities that have been committed in Africa and in Hungary and Asia and in Latin America are brought before the United Nations, and the Negro problem is never brought before the United Nations. Well, number one is because the United States is not part of the um, United Nations um, Committee on Human Rights. Well, it wasn't. I think um, Barack Obama just signed the Declaration of Human Rights just um a year or two ago, a couple of years ago. But I do not know if they sit on the committee. It says, this is part of the conspiracy. This is what Malcolm says. This old, tricky, blue-eyed liberal who is supposed to be your and my friend, supposed to be in our corner, supposed to be subsidizing our struggle, and supposed to be acting in the capacity of, of an advisor, never tells you anything about human rights. They keep you wrapped up in civil rights, and you spend so much time barking up the civil rights tree that you don't even know that there's a human rights tree on the same floor. When you expand the civil rights struggle to the level of human rights, you can then take the case of the black man in this country before the nation, in the United Nations. You can take, um, take it before the General Assembly. You can take Uncle Sam before a world court. But the only level you can do that on is on the level of human rights. Civil rights keep you under his restriction, under his jurisdiction. Civil rights keep you in his pocket. All right? Civil rights means you're asking Uncle Sam to treat you right. Human rights are something you were born with. Human rights are your God-given rights. Human rights are the rights that are recognized by all nations of the world. And anytime anyone violates your human rights, you can take them to the world court. All right? Now, once again, as of September 2004, the United States is still not a member of the World Court. Now, Uncle Sam, the Malcolm goes on, Uncle Sam's hands are dripping with blood, dripping with the blood of the black man in this country. He's the earth number one hypocr um, hypocrite. He has the audacity. Yes, he has. Imagine him posing as the leader of the free world. The free world, and you over here singing, we shall overcome. Expand the civil rights struggle to the level of human rights. Take it into the United Nations, where our African brothers can throw their weight on our side, where our Asian brothers can throw their weight on our side, where our Latin brothers, um, Latin American brothers can throw their weight on our side, and where 800 million Chinamen are sitting there waiting for, um, waiting to throw their weight on our side. Let the world know how bloody his hands are. Let the world know the hypocrisy. They um that practice over here. And that's what Malcolm said. So when we're talking about human rights, he says God given rights, so that's part of the hierarchy of law. The first order of law is natural law. These are the universal principles. All right, now we know in ancient times they were known as the law of Mayat and the universal seven principles of Tahuti. All right, now which are necessarily agreed with nature and the state of man that without observing the inherent maxims the peace and happiness of society can never be preserved. Knowledge of natural law may be obtained merely by the light of reason from the facts of their essential agreement with the constitution of human rights or human nature. It says natural law exists regardless of whether it is enacted as positive law. So natural law exists whether it is enacted as positive law. So that means that um, natural law is something in which that is from the light of reason, from from that's God given rights. So when law begins to emerge into a human conscious thoughts, words and deeds, we come to the next order of law on this planet. The most fundamental law of all humans has to do with survival, which is a universal principle. It has to do with um human interaction of all kinds, relationships, buying and selling or trading and relating in any way. All right. It is based upon treating and dealing with each other the way that you would like to be treated or dealt with. This is the law of commerce, all right? So this is the science. You do your nationality in which that puts you up under natural law, universal principles. Then you have to do 
um, the UCC one financial statements or the affidavit claim of lien in which that puts you up under the law of commerce. In order to operate under the law of commerce, it has been in operation since man interacted with each other and started many thousands of years ago through Sumerian or Babylonian era, which it is codified and enforced. Ancient artifacts dating back over 600,000 years reveal that the system was so complex it even involved receipts, coin money, shopping lists, manifestos, and a postal system with the, um, with the minimum day in baked clay. All right? Now, as a derivative of the commerce or the commercial law being removed from natural law, therefore, um, inferior is common law. Common law, all right? Um, this emerged basically in England out of disputes over a portion of the earth in Elodium, all right, sovereign ownership of the land, and was based on common sense. So common law is the law of the earth. Common law gives rise to the jury system and many writs and process which governments have um, absorbed, um, statutized, and made in rules and regulations, possesses in court. Now, common law procedures was based on the opportunity to face your accuser or the injured party in front of witnesses to sort out the problem directly. This process was never intended to include lawyers, attorneys, or judges, or construe their own law as this um, as these titles are all based upon the fiction of representation, which can never be the real thing, all right? This is why they claim to have a bar card in which they don't have a bar card. Um, they have a certificate, all right? And the bar, bar means British Accreditation Regency. So they are actually agents of the British government, I mean, they gave up their United States citizenship. So how can a British agent represent you as an alleged United States citizen, but then act on behalf of the state, which is in a corporation? This whole thing is confusing, at least for the average person. Not confusing for me or for those who know law because we we'll deal with natural law which are the maximums inherited from God, which is above all of the laws in which they be talking about. It's above the law of commerce. It's above the law of common law. Common law procedures were based on opportunity, like we said, to face your accuser or injured party. Now, after common law comes governments and their laws and legislative regulations, um, you know, their organic republics of the states. The only law that the state can create is to allow commerce to flow more efficiently within the state. The only law, all right, the central government, United States of America, can create is to allow, once again, commerce to flow more efficiently between the states. All right? It was never meant to regulate the people, the sovereigns. We the people, the Lenape, the Washington. It was never meant to regulate us. How we know? Because Dred Scott Case said that we was not U.S. citizens and we would never be. So that means the only thing we had to do was put forth our nationality, our status. Let's look in the Black's Law Dictionary, Natural Law. Law which is so necessarily agreed with by nature and the state of man that without observing its maxims, the peace and happiness of society can never be preserved. Knowledge of natural law may be obtained merely by the light of reason. This is what we just finished talking about. This is Barron's, the third edition, B-A-R-R-O-N, apostrophe S, the third edition. Natural law exists regardless whether it is enacted as positive law, although there may be instances where natural law cannot be judicially enforced. Now, let's go to natural people, a natural person, excuse me, a human being, as opposed to an artificial or fictional person, such as a corporation. Your name spelled in all caps on all of these instruments in which that supposedly make you a United States citizen actually is nothing more than what makes you an artificial or fictitious person. The phrase natural person does not include corporate entities, but the phrase person without qualification may or may not include artificial persons, depending on the context. So that means if you use the word person without saying natural person, it can be construed to mean artificial person too. Thus the phrase no person in the 14th Amendment 
um, equals protection clause that has been held to include natural and artificial persons. But the same phrase, no person in the Fifth Amendment privilege against self um, discrimination, or excuse me, self incrimination clause have been held to include only natural persons and not corporate corporations, since the privilege is personal and may not be asserted by an artificial person. This is Barron's um, um, Law Dictionary, third edition, also. All right. So this is how the IRS justifies insisting that the flesh and blood man and woman um, testifies against himself as well as the court. People answering up to the name of their fictitious trade name, which is their name spelled in all caps, their straw man name, is called then the IRS enforces or the courts enforces its commercial agenda against the people by treating them like their trade name or artificial person or artificial entity or corporation. The above um, definition is enlightening. But it is taken from a law dictionary. Please realize that in the scheme of life, it is just as impossible for a person to be natural as it is for a man to be artificial. Okay? So a person technically can't be natural. And a man can't be artificial. But this is the foolishness in which that they have um, produced. All right? Now... When we talk about um, the hierarchy of law, we spoke about natural law. Well, then we have to go to the law of nature. The law of nature is that which God, the sovereign of the universe, has prescribed to all men. And remember, man was made in the image and after the likeness of God. So man himself is also sovereign. Okay? It is discovered by um, just consideration of the agreeableness and the disagreeableness of human actions to the nature of man. And it comprehends all the duties which we owe either to the supreme being, to ourselves, and to our neighbors as rever um, reverence to God, self-defense, temperance, honor to our parents, benevolence to all, and a strict adherence to our engagements, gratitude, and the likes. So if we were in tune with nature, then there would be, um, there would be no lying, no dishonesty, because we would fall under the nature of law properly. All right, and that correlates to the laws of nations, which is a private international law um, being um, between sovereign individuals, family, tribes, courts, grand juries, townships, counties, states, and nations that has been well established under various international conventions for thousands of years. All the administrative rules and regulations, statutes, and the Uniform Commercial Code or the UCC and the constitutions of various countries are all based ultimately on the organic law of nations and also on the organic law of nature. The law of nations is the law of sovereigns derived from the principles of natural law. It is from the law of nations that the constitutions are created and lawful de jure governments are consummated. We're now in de facto governments in which that they try to justify their existence by the rule of force and coercion. Um, threat, to, um, threat, duress, and coercion, coercion instead of the rules of law. So a de facto government acts under legal or legalities, but not under law, and are not lawful. Okay. Now, when you read in the Black Law Dictionary, also. You look up the word sovereign, it's, it means one who possesses supreme authority, a chief or highest supreme, supreme in power, supreme in position to all others, independent of and unlimited by or any other. All right. Um, it also said possibly the best or simplest definition of what a sovereign actually is, is contained within the definition of the term sojuris, which means of his own right, possessing full social and civil right not under any um, legal disability or the power of another or guardianship. The unit of sovereignty, autonomy, and government is each free will being. So see sujur or um, suis, sujur, um, sujuris, um, quote from Theodore Roosevelt on solvents, at, um, and 
and you read the word more in the Black's Law Dictionary, it says an officer of the hours of man who summons the courts for several shreddings. The office is similar to the English bailiffs of 100. So one more is actually worth 100 sheriffs or 100 bailiffs in the court of law. And the only time that a more goes to court is based on the fact of the court paying him and not receiving money and not getting money from him. Now, if you don't understand this, I will recommend that you get the book Ancient and Modern Britons, Volume 1 and 2, by David Marici, and he tells you that up until um, the early um, up until the early 1900s, the Ultima Empire, which is actually the Kushite Empire, which is also the Empire of Ashtar Dikdagmanya, which is also the Songhai, Malian Empire, um, which is all one and the same, the different names over the various years in order to confuse us through the Reconstructive Era. Um, the European countries used to pay us tribute. In other words, this is where the term blackmail came from, because any time that they had to um, sell the seven seas, they had to pay us to do so. Because the Moors were the navigators of the seven seas and also the masters of the seven continents. Now, if you don't believe that, go to Black's Law Dictionary, 4th Edition Deluxe, and go to Amorality Law, or Amorality. It says, Amorality, a court which has a very extensive jurisdiction of the maritime cause, civil and criminal controversies arising from out of the acts done upon or related to the sea, and questions of prize. Now, I just finished telling you that we was the masters of the seven seas, and they paid us tribute. Now, check this out. It is properly the successor of the consular courts. We won't get to the consular courts in a second, which was emphatically the courts of merchants and seagoing persons. So this is where we used to go to court at as Moors. We went through the consular courts. The Amorality courts claim to be the proper successors of the consular courts. All right, now, it says, establishing the principal maritime cities of the revival of commerce, the revival of commerce after the fall of the Western Empire. What is this Western Empire that they're talking about? Because I could have sworn that we in the West and that this was the empire and it is still thriving, at least for now, even though um, the U.S. dollar is getting ready to collapse and erode the economy um, to the point in which that um, they would have to usher in the Amero dollar, in which that would be a revive of um, silver and gold standard. Um, however, that has not happened as of yet. So what is this fall of Western Empire that they're referring to? Well, it has to be the Western Empire, which they just finished talking about, which the old um, Ultima, um, Songhai Malian, um, Omec, Washator Empire, one in the same, Kushite Empire, one in the same. All right, and it says here that... Um, Maritime cities on the revival of commerce after the fall of the Western Empire to supply the wants of tribunals that might decide cause arising out of the maritime commerce. Also, the system of jurisprudence relating to and growing out of jurisdiction and practice of admiralty court. Now, let's go to consular court. Consular court by the consuls of one government or country within the territory of another under authority given by treaty for the settlement of civil cases. In some cases, or some instances, excuse me, they have also a criminal jurisdiction, but in this respect, we're subject to review by the courts of the home government, the last of the United States Consular Court, Morocco, was abolished in 1956. The last of the United States Consular Court was Morocco. Why was the Consular Court here in the United States, or why, as we would say, that the United States were in Morocco. And if and when was this United States in Morocco when I could sworn that Morocco was a French, um, was colonized by the French, and speak French to this day, as a matter of fact, in the form of Arabic, you know, in which that actually they did not gain their freedom until 1959, and that's when the flag of the Moroccan flag, which is the five-pointed star uh, in the red background, in which that Noble Drali um, supposedly um, got from um, the president uh, between 1910 and 1913, um, according to um, it could have been Calvin Coolidge or it could have been Woodrow Wilson, um, depending on um, whomever you were asked about the storyline in which that supposedly this flag was given over in 1959. So Morocco, the kingdom, did not gain their freedom until 1959. So we're talking about the empire, though, of Morocco. 
remember we gave you the clue earlier in which that um, is mentioned within the Moorish Holy Temple of Science, um, Moorish um, Holy Quran Circle 7, where it states within um, Egypt, the Dominion of America, um, where it states in that particular chapter that Northwest Africa, all the way to the North, Central, and South America, was given as the possession of the Moabites or Moors. So we are in the empire Morocco or Al Morocco or Al Morocco or America or America. Let's look at the word slave. A person who is wholly subject to the will of another, who has no freedom of action, but whose person is and services are wholly up to the control of another, and who is under the power of a master and who belongs to him, so the master may sell and dispose of his person or of his industry or and of his labor with him without his being able to do anything, have anything, or acquire anything, but who must belong to his master. This is Black's Law Dictionary, 4th edition. Now, this correlates to the fact that we are chattel property, if we are three-fifths of a human being, as Malcolm stated, in which that Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution state that we are three-fifths of a human being or three-fifths of a person, um, chattel property would be that, and it says Article of Personal Property, any species of property not amounting to free, whole, or fee in land. Um, the term chattel is a more comprehensive one than goods, as it includes animated as well as inanimated property. So animated means you are animated with the spirit of God. And so hence, you can be chattel property also, as well as inanimated property. This is Black's Law Dictionary, first edition. So you are chattel property, and you have tied to you chattel papers. Your birth certificate is that bond with your name spelled in all caps on it. And it has a bond number on it, and the word bond is short for bondage. So that is your chattel paper. Your child of paper means a record or records that is evident between a monetary obligation and a security interest in Pacific goods. You are the goods. You are the commodity. They are using you on the stock market through the DTC, Depository Trust Company or Corporation, and its subsidiaries, corporations, and have put you behind on the stock market because you are worth your weight in gold. And when a child is born between 5 to 10 pounds, they're worth nearly $1 million or more at birth. And then as you come of age at 18, it matures. That bond matures and goes on the open market. And corporations and countries around the world can purchase and bunch those bonds together and sell you for hundreds and, and millions of, hundreds of millions of dollars. And you don't know anything about CTQ Trust in which that states, according to the Black Store Dictionary, 6th edition, that you have a benefit in. And you don't know how to fill out a UCC1 financial statement in which that gives you the ability in order to tap into that. And you truly don't know what the back of the Social Security card is, which is your IMF or International Monetary Fund number, which is also a prepaid levy bond number. And, it's, and I said prepaid because the prepaid funds are or the ones in which I'm talking about, the fiat notes or the credit or whatever you want to refer to it is, or as, is um, attached to that bond. And which they have you in bondage, which have you as a slave, which is that birth certificate. But no Prophet no Ali told you not to mess with the birth certificate. So how do you capture your straw man name, which is your name spelled in all caps on that bond? Well, you do a UCC1 financial statement. And as Prophet Nobu Ali instructed, you change your name, and you would um, annex the name El or Bey or Ali, you know, for those who um, have reached the level of Ali, which is to the, um, which means who have reached your higher self for the most high God, which very few has, and this is why he said don't use that name, because you have not reached those that state of enlightenment, so use El or Bey. El means within um, Hebrew, God, power, force. Bey means within Arabic, which comes from Beya, which means ruler, earth, or landlord, governor. So 
um, you can um, add that to your name or choose a new name and add that title to your name. And you can use the UCC1 financial statement and capture it by becoming a secure creditor. Um, put that name, Indigenous Appalachian, or your free national name in that particular area. And then put the debtor's name, which is your birth name, which is the one who is enslaved or in bondage, in that area. And you now take over um, all the property and assets of that. But there is no bond attached to your Indigenous Appalachian. So they have not put a bond on um, Osorio Ali in New Bay. They don't have a bond in that name. These are the things that you have to learn. And why? Because the Jews have this banking system ran. And if you don't know that they run the banking system, then <laughs> I've already broke down to you in past um, talks or shows how they control um, the finances as well as also the entertainment or economics. So I won't get into it here. However, I will say this. If you look up the word goy, which is the, um, and it's plural, goyim, often disparaging a non-Jewish person, Gentile, also a goy, which means Yiddish, a non-Jew, Webster. And you go to look up the word goyim, it means a foreign nation, hence a Gentile, also a troop of animal, or a flight of lotus, Gentile, heathen nation, people, the new strong, exhaustive concordance of the Bible, which is 1995. Um, note, literally, Gohim means nation. It is also Jewish slang for cattle. Remember, the word chattel, which is a French word, which means cattle. So you have your cattle papers or your chattel papers. But chattel, um, but Jewish, but the sh Jewish slang, Gohim, means cattle or animals. Per Jewish thinking, there are only two nations in the world the Jewish nation, and the Gentile non-Jewish nation. When you say that you are more, you're saying that you are Israelite. Hence, you follow the, under the laws of Judaism. And the word Judah is actually from the word Jehuti, which is the seven principles of Jehudi or Tahudi, which are mentalism, cause and effect, which is karma, um, polarity, Rhythm, vibration, gender, correspondence. You know, these are the seven laws of Tahuti or Jehuti, which is what formed Judaism. Where the name Judah and Judas comes from. So when you say you are more, you're saying that you're Israelite, that you're not part of the Gentile, non Jewish. Um, nation. So hence, you can't be a three-fifth of a human being. You can't be classified as the going cattle or animal. You can't have chattel papers. You can't be described as a monster, a monster, a human being by birth. This is Black's Law First Diction, Black's Law's Dictionary, on um, first edition. A monster, a human being by birth, but in some parts resembling a lower animal, a human. Um, have not inheritable blood and cannot be heir to any land. Ballantine Law and Dictionary, 1930. A prodigious birth, a human being or offspring, and not having the shape of, hum of mankind, which cannot be heir to any land, albeit is brought forth in marriage. So a monster is someone who has no inheritable blood and cannot be heir to any land. That's a monster. That's how you are classified right now, three-fifths of a being, three-fifths of a person, as a monster, as a goheen, a cattle, animal. Hence the reason why um, Noble Drali said that um, without a free national name, we are listed as undesirables. Hence the term now why they refer to us as useless eaters. And the reason why they want to propagate their um, um, their population control agenda and eradicate um, more than 6 billion people on the planet. I know back in 1987, I think I read an article in New Amsterdam News, 
in Harlem when I was living in Harlem. It might have been longer than that. So I think that was around probably eighty, around eighty, between eighty-four to eighty-six, somewhere around there. The article said specifically that 2.8 billion non-white people must be eliminated from the face of the planet, preferably by famine, drugs, disease, and war. So, basically what this means is that we're goods. Goods means all things that are movable when security interest attaches. Well, what's the security um, interest that's attached? It's the birth certificate. That's what gives you the ability in order to be that movable instrument of goods. And it says all things which are movable at the time of identification to the contract for sale. Investment, security, and things in action. And includes the unborn young of animals. This is Blackstone Dictionary, 6th edition. So who are the um, unborn young of animals? The Gohim, remember, the Jews refer to it as the Gohim, animals, cattle. And then they say the unborn. Well, what happens when you go to the hospital? And they have the mother and father listed as the informants, which means snitches on the birth certificate. And then they have the artificial names attached to it. NBC status, Negro, black, and colored. Not more, which is a proper noun, but Negro, black, and colored, which are adjectives. But right here, according to the Jewish encyclopedia, and Gentiles above, a Gentile is a beast. Then it also says, see, fill warehouse receipt. A warehouse receipt is actually, once again, your birth certificate. Identification of goods. A Gentile, a Gohim, a beast. It says all things movable equals newborn children. At the time, the security interest attached, birth, and execution, registration of the birth document, certificate, identification to the contract, equals newborn footprints, and the informer's mother's signature, contract, equals birth certificate, things in action, equals human fetus, newborn baby, unborn young of the animal, equals human fetus. That's what it's called, and that's that's according to the strong um, concordance of the um, um, the strong exhaustive concordance of the Bible in Gohim. Gohim equals animal, as we said, according to the Jewish encyclopedia. In Gentile, um, a Gentile is a beast. You must understand that. So that is listed as an artificial person, an entity such as a corporation created by law and given certain legal rights and duties of a human being as being real or imaginary, who for the purpose of legal reasoning is treated more or less like a human being. Also term um, fictitious person, juridic person, legal person. This is Black's Law Dictionary, 7th edition. So when you read the Dress Scott case versus Sanford of um, 1856-1857, it says a free Negro of the African race whose ancestry was brought to this country and sold as slaves is not a citizen with the mean, um, with, um, within the meaning of the Constitution of the United States. And Judge Taney goes on to say, and would never be. It says that there is no rights which the white man are bound to respect. <laughs> but yet they claim that they over they superseded the Dred Scott case with. Um, the 14th Amendment being ratified, but the 14th Amendment never was ratified. According to the joint resolution, proposed um, proposing states amendment was not submitted to or adopted by the um, Congressional Congress per Article 1, Section 3, and Article 5 of the United States Constitution. It was never submitted to the President for his approval as required by Article 1, Section 7 of the Constitution. The proposed 14th Amendment was rejected by more than one-fourth of all of the states then in the Union, and it was never ratified by three-fourths of all the states in the Union as required by Article 5 of the United States Constitution. So the 14th Amendment is not constitutional. Fifteen states out of the um, then 37 states of the Union rejected the, the proposed 14th Amendment um, between the date of, this, um, of, of its submission 
by the states by the Secretary of State on June 16th, 1864, um, excuse me, 1866, and March 24th, 1868, thereby further nullifying said resolution and making it impossible for its ratification by the constitutionally required three-fourths of each state. Texas, October 27, 1866, denied it. Georgia, November 9, 1866, denied it. Florida, December 6, 1866, denied it. Alabama, December 7, 1866, denied it. Arkansas, December 17, 1866, denied it. Kentucky, January the 8th, 1867, denied it. Virginia, January the 9th, 1867, denied it. Louisiana, February the 6th, 1867, denied it. Delaware, February the 7th, 1867, denied it. Maryland, March 23rd, 1867, denied it. Mississippi, January the 13th, um, excuse me, January the 31st, 1867, denied it. Ohio, January the 16th, 1868, denied it. No, um, New Jersey, March 24th, 1868, denied it. South Carolina, um, December 20th, 1866, denied it. And even North Carolina, where I'm at, December the 14th, 1866, denied it. All 15 states rejected the 14th Amendment. So none of us are 14th Amendment citizens. None of us are citizens of the United States, technically. Let's look at the word Negro in the Black Law Dictionary, fourth edition. The word Negro means a black man, one descended from the African race and does not commonly include a mulatto. Now, you got the word Negro, black, African, and mulatto all in the same sentence. Now, at least out three of the ones, at least three are on the birth certificates. On my birth certificate, it says black. On my mother's birth certificate, it has Negro. On my grandmother's birth certificate, it has colored. Because every 30 years, they change, um, and they have been changing um, the adjective. In, 19, in the 1900s, it was Negro. 1930, it was colored. 1960, it was black. 1990, it was African American. By the laws of the different states are not uniform in this respect. Some include in the description Negro is one who has one-eighth or more of African blood. The term Negro means necessarily person of color, but not every person of color is Negro. This is Rice versus um, Gong Loon, 139, Mississippi, 760. So it says the term Negro means necessarily persons of color, but not every person of color is Negro. Interesting. Go to Black's Law Dictionary, 4th edition. Again, it says black person. All right, I remember when Ali Muhammad saying that um, the dictionary don't um, have the word black in it. Well, that's a lie. It has a black person in it. And according to this definition, it said black person, according in the Constitution, the law must be taken in its generic sense as contradiction from white. So black person and white person, both are generic terms. This is also rights versus gong loom. 139 Mississippi. Look at the word color. The word color. It says, by common usage in America, this term in such phrases, color person, the color race, color men, and the likes, is used to designate Negroes and people of African race, including all people of mixed blood descended from Negro ancestry. College versus Oklahoma State Hospital 70, Oklahoma. It says, but, there, but we're a... State constitution provides for separation of schools for the whites and colored race. The term white race was held to be limited to the Caucasian race and the term colored race to embrace all other races. This is Rice versus Gung Loom, 139 Mississippi again. It has also be held <clears throat> it has also been held that there is no legal technical significance to the phrase color person which the courts are bound judicially to know. This Pascoff versus Dow's 31, Texas, 74. So these are all, they say black person is a generic term. They say colored um, is a term um, that is not, have no technical, um, legal technical significance to the phrase color person, which the courts are, are bound judicially to know. Black is a generic term. It says um, Negro, 
um, that um, not every person of color is a Negro, then what is um, those who are of color that are not a Negro? That's the question. What are they? Well, you have the word civilis mortus, which means civically dead, dead in the view of the law, the conditions of one who has lost his civil rights and capacities and is accounted dead in law. This is Razor versus Razor, 173, South Carolina, 365. Now, civilis mortus, um, you're dead in the eye civically in law. So when we talk about civil rights, when we're saying that we're three-fifths of, um, of a person and we don't have human rights, then um, this is why in civilis mortus we can't possibly um, have civil rights because um, as long as we're three-fifths of a human being or three-fifths of a person, we're actually up under civilis mortus status which means that we're civically dead. So it appears that they gave us civil rights, but how could that be when we're not even citizens of the United States and the 14th Amendment was never fully ratified? And according to the Dred Scott case, you would never be citizens. Well, here's another definition of Black's Law Dictionary, fourth edition. It says, in full life, continuing in both physical and civil existence. There is, there is neither actually dead nor civilist mortus. So that's what you want to be is in full life. But have full life and human life status, not in civil rights status, because actually there is no civil rights if you want to know the truth of the matter. So this is what we have to um, overstand when it comes to this information. Um, we're going to go to the lines, and hopefully um, we got some questions here once again. All right. Caller 302, you're on the line. Caller 302. Come on, you're on the line. Call it 302. And then in 0680, you're on the line. All right, call it 313, you're on the line. Call it 313. All right, going to another caller, 302. All right, this is caller 786, excuse me. Caller 786, you're on the line. Oh, uh, I'm on the line, brother. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, brother. Oh, okay, I didn't intentionally uh, put my hand up, but since that we're connected, um, I did research that um, I did research that story that you stated last Wednesday concerning uh, the uh, the China troops in Mexico. Right. And 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 concerning that, uh, uh, one truck driver uh, he had to be escorted by the Mexican uh, federal police into that area. I believe uh, it was 60 miles south of uh, a Texas small town called Delero or something to that effect. Right. Where he analyzed the situation, and uh, he, he he knows that the base was like two miles wide to three miles uh, deep uh, in, in 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 radius, and uh, he was definitely uh, he was shook in his shoes because of what he saw. And according to the story, he was uh, also looking at uh, 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 Humvees, or you might say, or tanks that was lined up, and the way they were lined up in numbers, he could uh, discern. Uh, uh, an estimate count about 10,000 or maybe somewhere in that vicinity, and also that it, between 8 to 10 uh, uh, personnel could fit inside those vehicles. So uh, obviously if something's getting ready to go down, and uh, I was also listening to one of the, uh, one of the economic uh, 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 leading uh, authority voices, uh, Gerald Salente, where he was stating that, uh, we are caught up in all of these uh, holidays, which doesn't belong to the Moors, but we are also taking it up in right. like rituals and practices. And he's also stated that we, uh, we need to look out for a, a, a sudden drop in the stock market either before or uh, after uh, these holidays pass because they're going to set us up where we're going to buy all this crap that really we don't need uh, 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 and, and, and wind up uh, we're going to get shorthanded. So there's something that's definitely getting ready to go down pertaining to um, uh, the story that, that we're talking about with the, the troops in Mexico and also the uh, the, uh, the so-called alleged uh, stock market crash or the bank holiday run. There's something that's getting ready to go down. 
Exactly. And that's the whole key because the Chinese have um, actually are the owners of the most debt notes, you know, which is the yeah. American FRNs or the fiat notes. And they are here because it's a debt note. It's an IOU, a promissory yeah. note. And so they are here to collect on that promise. And who are they yeah, going to use in order to collect on that are the American people because we are the ones who are under bondage and have no security. We are not the secure creditors of those contracts. That's indeed. indeed we do that's not true. have we do not have the superior lien on those contracts. We have not claimed um um through any affidavits or notices that we are the superior claim holders on those contracts. So therefore, when they come in, you know, um then it's possible that, you know, we don't know what might possibly go down, but I do know yes. that we need to be um preparing, you know, um yes. you know, as far as um um um, in every shape, form, and fashion. Yes, indeed, indeed. And also, too, one more other thing, brother. Uh, concerning, you know, we they discovered the I think I believe some five hundred thousand uh, coffins in somewhere in uh, South Georgia, West, make making right exactly. Yeah, making Georgia, which, be, mm-hmm. which could be uh, tied into the uh, over excitement, and also could activate um, the uh, Rex eighty four. Right. Could activate that and also target yeah. all the, uh, the, the, the 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 boot licking uh, uh, pastors that's keeping this also perpetuate this foolishness going on when most of them know the truth that they won't tell us the truth and, and get right. them out of the way. That's right. That's right. That's right, yes, brother. Indeed. You're right about that. No doubt about it. Well, I appreciate you, brother. Once again, yes, you know, we get ready to um end the show because we got to end with that because you just dropped it, all right now, and um, okay. um we gonna see y'all back here once again next Wednesday eight o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Peace. Come on back and check out the Dr. Arlene Bay show. <laughs> First World Order Radio, finally, finally, we are on the air. No doubt. All right, all right. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. We get on into some of that order consciousness tonight. First World Order Radio every Wednesday, 8 p.m. We got to talk about what is taking place on the planet. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. First, we need to let you know we're going to be doing more shows, giving out more information on Wednesdays. Wednesday is 8 o'clock. We are now going to make this is the hottest day of the week. Proceeding in others in time, order, and importance, the most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns in existence and the definite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. Proceeding in others in time, order, importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns in existence and the definite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. You need to understand how magical this, uh, something like this every Wednesday can become. So you need to start uh, getting your calendar right, getting your schedule, your schedule right. You need to know how intention is straight out. All right, so I mean, these clues are given throughout the various languages was to piece the puzzle of this ancient history school back together again. And what we plan on doing, both of us, is bringing y'all some surefire dynamite. We're going to take this level up a notch. We're going to have stuff to do here. This is not just going to be about philosophies and theories, shit that works.